just because you get a bad diagnosis, it doesn't mean that it's over. It doesn't mean you have to give up and quit. I've been told many, many times that it can't be done, that it can't be beaten, that you just have to put up with, that this is the way it is. If people tell you it can't be done because they haven't seen it done. That's basically it. So show them that it can be done. Don't give up. Don't get depressed. Hard times happen in many different ways and they don't last forever. It just means that it's just a challenge. Nothing is impossible. Okay. It's just a challenge. That's all it is. Today, we're with David, DC at DC Learning to Live, and I appreciate you joining us, David. And it's a pleasure talking with you and getting your in insight and inspiration with the issue surrounding cancer and the carnivore diet. So, David, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. Um, well, first of all, thanks for having me, Adam. I really appreciate you having me on the channel. Sure. Um, yeah, I've been, actually, I've been watching your videos for a while, but just, uh, just I love the quality. Yeah, brilliant. Um, yeah. yeah, so about me, I, my family, uh, like I live in Australia at the moment, I spent, um, 10 years living in Japan. Um, my wife is Japanese and, uh, we came to Australia back in 2012, um, after we spent, uh, like 2011 was spent basically rebuilding from the 311 event that happened in March 11, 2011, we were hit by a nine magnitude earthquake and then tsunami that hit us afterward. Um, wow. and yeah, that was a big year. Um, in, in Japan, I was working as a strength and conditioning coach. Uh, I worked for, um, uh, a couple of different teams that are trained cyclists, track cyclists, and, uh, um, also, uh, basketball players. I, um, when it came to uh, the reason we came back to Australia, uh, was about nine months after, uh, the earthquake, uh, we, we pretty much spent, uh, that whole year just trying to rebuild and, um, trying to get our careers back online, um, my business going again and, um, my wife back to work and things like that after the, the big cleanup. And, um, you know, I, through that time I was having trouble, you know, I was kept, you know, getting colds and flus, had a very weak immune system and I couldn't figure out why at the time. Um, but Christmas came around and I decided to come back to Australia just to visit my family and, you know, at the time it was, it was kind of more of a hassle for me because I, I was just figured, look, I'd just come back and see him just to, because they were constantly uh, telling me to come back to Australia after the earthquake and tsunami saying I needed to take care of myself and that sort of thing. But, um, I came back just to convince them that I was fine. There was nothing wrong and I was uh, doing fine. But while I was here, um, I figured I'd get a checkup because when I first, when I got off the plane and I arrived in Brisbane, uh, it's winter in Japan. It was minus two when I left and 32 degrees when I came to Australia. So, uh, you know, it was kind of a big temperature gap. Wow. But as soon, as soon as I get off, got off the plane and I had a flu again. So I figured, well, I, I got to get this sorted out. So I, I went to the doctor and, uh, while I was here and decided to get, just get a checkup. Um, so th that was the, the beginning of everything really. Um, okay. we, we pretty much, we, we lost a lot, uh, in that, that year. So it was kind of, um, you know, celebrating Christmas wasn't really high on my priorities, but I, I figured I'd just come back and see the family and, and see how they're going. But, mm -hmm. um, while I was here, um, the doctor decided to do some blood tests and he gave me some medications for the flu and, uh, away I went for a couple of days. Um, and then he, he called me back in to have a look at the, the check, the blood results. And he was uh, a little bit puzzled 
because I was quite fit. Um, like even the, the day I left the, um, Japan, I spent that morning in the gym. Like I was still, uh, training pretty well. Mm-hmm. Um, like I was having good days and bad days and I just put it down to age. You know, I was getting old. I was 38 and um, <laughs> I was thinking, yeah, I, I, you know, I'm not performing as, as well as I should be sort of thing. But, um, yeah, just 38 and I was thinking I was getting old, mm. but, um, <laughs> <laughs> so he, he couldn't understand why my blood results were so poor or my, uh, like the average markers and everything were, mm-hmm. um, like say, for example, just platelets, for example, um, and other markers are like between 150 and 450 for a normal healthy range. Mine were down in, in the 50s, 60s and 80s. Um, oh, yeah, so I was really low. Um, so he, he felt around my stomach a bit and he found, you know, quite a big lump. Um, he, he didn't want to tell me what it was. He didn't really, it was just a local GP, so he didn't want to speculate. So he, he sent my results. He was sent me off for scans and I had, um, uh, an X-ray and ultrasound done on my abdomen. And he sent the results to a, a hospital. The only thing he did tell me was that I, he thinks I should stay in Australia to get this sorted out because I was only here for a two week vacation. Okay. So all I had with me was one backpack full of clothes. And, um, so that day I, I got home to my parents' place. That's where I was staying at the time. Um, and I, I called my wife and I said, look, I, I might be staying in Australia just a little bit, like maybe a couple of weeks longer because uh, I might be sicker than I thought. And, um, it was about, I think, uh, a day later, she called me back and she said, look, I'm, I'm going to fly out to Australia and, um, I'll be there on, on the board, which was the day I was actually due to fly back to Japan. Mm-hmm. Um, she, she didn't originally come out. She didn't originally come out with me because she had to work, but she managed to get three weeks off because I was sick and you know, decided to come out. So. That was really good. Actually, I was, I was a bit of a surprise. Um, but you know, through the Christmas period, there's not much happening to hospitals, doctors, and all that sort of thing. But the day she arrived on the 4th of January, uh, I got a call from, um, the hospital in, in the city in Brisbane. Yeah. It was about a four hour drive from where my parents live out in the countryside. And they asked me, um, to come in and see them. Um, they said it was quite urgent because it was about seven o'clock at night. It's about a four hour drive. My wife had just arrived about three hours before. So I said, it's not going to happen. I'm not going in that, that night. And mm-hmm. you know, I felt fine anyway. I didn't, I didn't really see the urgency. Um, so we all made the trip the next day. And, you know, you go into a hospital, you go to the emergency, especially public hospital, you go to the emergency, um, entrance and you, you expect to wait for hours at a time. Right. Right. So I walked in, I gave him my name and like 10 minutes later I was in a bed. Uh, and wow. I was, yeah. So, um, by that time my, my head started to spin on thinking, okay, there's something wrong here because, you know, they don't see you that quick here. Um, and then all of a sudden I'm surrounded by doctors and nurses and my, my head's just spinning and they're giving me all this information and telling me what it could be because they haven't done any blood tests or anything else yet, any biopsies or anything. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know, this was, I mean, of course it's all in English, my wife didn't understand what they were talking about. So it got a bit emotional. Um. So that's when, uh, all the tests started and they, they did a week of tests. Some of them are extremely painful. They took a biopsy. I had a, I have a large mass or a large tumor wrapped around my aorta, uh, about the size of a football. 
Um, wow, really? And because I was, yeah. And it, because I was so, I was pretty lean at the time. So I, I didn't have any visceral fat or anything like that. So it was making room to grow by crushing all the organs around it. And what it had done, it was, it had killed my left kidney and my right kidney, um, was down to just 12% capacity. Hmm. So it, I had, um, by the end of the test came back, they told me I had very high stage four follicular lymphoma. Uh, lymphoma is a, a type of blood cancer that starts in, um, the, in the lymphatic system. Um, the tumor had grown so big that it had been crushing my kidneys. So it, it was a kind of a race between, uh, either the cancer or the kidneys were going to kill me first. They didn't expect the kidney to last another month without treatment. Um. I think the only thing that sort of kept it going is the fact that I drank a lot of water, but they basically gave me two months, maybe three at the very outside to survive without treatment. Wow. Um, and the, the prognosis, I mean, that was the diagnosis, but the prognosis after that was even worse. They, they it's follicular lymphoma, meaning that it's a, a type of reoccurring cancer that will never leave you. Um, and the more you treat it, the, the more, uh, the faster it will come back so that the shorter your remission periods will be and the more aggressive it becomes. So basically they're telling you that even if you survive the treatment, the best you can hope for is a remission period, but that remission period won't last. Um, and basically the rest of your life, you're going to need more and more treatments. You know, um, and when you, or when you're already very high stage four, uh, you kind of wonder, well, how much worse can it get? You know, mm -hmm. um, it's already aggressive, obviously. Um, so the first thing I had to do before I could even start treatment was, um, get, uh, stints put in to open up the flow for my, my kidneys. Otherwise they wouldn't be able to handle the, the treatment, the chemotherapy. Um, mm -hmm. so, uh, it was, uh, it wasn't just that at the time, it wasn't just that they were. I really wasn't concerned about the cancer itself. It didn't really fade. Like it didn't really sink in just then. Mm -hmm. What they were also telling me though, is that I just lost everything. I couldn't go back to Japan to where I was living. I, I, I couldn't keep my home. I couldn't keep my business. I couldn't keep everything that we had built up there and everything that we had just finished rebuilding after the earthquake. And all I had left was a backpack full of clothes. Um, and then my wife had to go back to Japan and she had to get rid of, uh, sell, give away, or, um, every, everything that she couldn't sell and, um, just get rid of everything that we couldn't keep. Um, now they only gave me like three months at the very outside to survive. And it was going to take my wife longer than that to get all this done. So we didn't even know if we were ever going to see each other again. So it was a very, um, a very emotional kind of, uh, month, you know, a few months. It was, you know, we didn't know if I was going to survive long enough for her to get back to Australia. And while she was doing all that, I had to try and find a way to get her into Australia so she could stay. So I had to start trying while I was going through chemotherapy, I had to try and set up a new life in Australia and arrange a visa for my wife to stay with me in Australia, uh, which is pretty hard to do when you're going through chemotherapy. Um, yeah, I can imagine. So let's, yeah. let's, let's pause here for just a second and, um, we'll come back to this. Uh, so. Let's, let's rewind back to, uh, you said that there was an earthquake in Japan, yeah. um, 
what was it? Nine, nine magnitude, you said? Nine magnitude, yeah. So before that happened, um, kind of tell us a little bit about your experiences in Japan. You know, you said your wife is Japanese. So is that you, you met your wife in Japan prior to this or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I met her in 2003. That was okay. the year I actually arrived in Japan. Um, about several, several months after I arrived, actually. Um, I initially, I went to Japan for about, um, I just finished studying, um, and I went to Japan for kind of a working holiday. I was okay. only going to stay there for about six months and I ended up staying there 10 years. I, I just enjoyed it so much. You know, it's just, um, such an easy, um, great place to live, you know? Um, so I, I had a great time actually while I was there, we did all kinds of things and it, it's just a great culture to be around actually, a lot of fun, very colorful, um, great sense of humor of the Japanese people. Um, but you know, when the earthquake came, it was just finishing winter, it was just about coming into spring and it was, it was really odd actually, it was starting to warm up. Mm -hmm. And ha this happened on the um, March 11th, just a few days before my birthday. And that night it started snowing again. You know, it actually shifted. I don't know. I, 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 I was read somewhere it actually shifted the poles. The earthquake was that hard. Oh, um, wow. But you know, we, we, we're get, starting to get some nice warm spring days. Mm -hmm. The earthquake here, and then that night it started snowing again, and snow it snowed heavy, you know. Oh, um, wow! And it wasn't, you know, the earthquake itself. You know, generally speaking, there's a lot of earthquakes in Japan, and they usually last, you know, fifteen to to forty seconds. That's about the longest they last. Mm -hmm. This one lasted uh, six minutes fifteen seconds. Wow! Yeah, it just was continuous for more than six minutes. That must have yeah. seemed like it went on forever. Yeah, it did. That was like the longest six minutes of my life. Um, well, at, at that point anyway. Um, and it wasn't just that earthquake either. There was so many for, for, for months and there's still actually now there's even aftershocks from that one quake, but some of the aftershocks in the weeks following were over eight magnitude themselves. That's um, yeah. And it, it got to the point where, um, like a friend of mine actually sent me a text message one morning, like a few weeks later when everything was starting to settle down, we had, um, like a, a seven magnitude earthquakes, like early in the morning and he sent me an earth, uh, a text message. He's like, you know, seven magnitude is not even worth getting out of bed now, but it will wake you up. <laughs> You know? Wow. So, yeah. Definitely better than an alarm clock. Yeah, yeah for yeah. sure. Yeah. But yeah, it just, we got so comfortable with every, with earthquakes over eight magnitude that seven magnitude just didn't feel like worth getting up for. Okay. That's incredible, man. Yeah. I can't even imagine. Yeah. And it, it was, we had to, from the first day. You know, everything was cut off. There was no power. There was uh, no water supply, no gas supply, and no food supply. All right. So, you know, all the shops were shut. Nothing was open. And, uh, but what a lot of shops were doing, they were bringing some of the stock outside into the car parks and selling like market style because mm -hmm. we weren't allowed to go into buildings that were still standing because the, the structural integrity hadn't been checked. Um, but yeah, that was one great thing I noticed. Yeah, you know, there was never any, um, fighting. There was no looting. There was no violence of any kind while this was all going on. Emergency services had, could focus on getting everything back on track and it was brilliant. It was absolutely brilliant. Um, people really came together. We all helped each other out. And, you know, we, we spent, we spent a couple of months basically 
riding around on bicycles because we couldn't get fuel for the car. Mm -hmm. Um, so we had to ride around on bicycles, um, trying to find food and water for my wife and myself and her mother and grandmother. Um, so, you know, there was a lot of, um, queues, you know, waiting in line for water, tubs of water and things like that. Some days we couldn't get any, some days we could, some days we couldn't find food, some days we could, it was very up and down. So we sort of had the ration everything and we could only get food that, um, none of it was fresh, obviously, because we didn't have any food supply. And, uh, so we could only get food that didn't require, uh, water or cooking or, you know, any sort of, so just basically snack foods so, or so that we could just eat it cold, you know? Right. Um, so we did uh, a lot of that. Um, eventually there was, um, a, a park that was close to the city because we lived outside the city between the city and the coastline. Um, and about a three kilometer walk, there was a park that uh, eventually got water supply that we could go and fill up, um, jerry cans full of water. Mm -hmm. So we did that for uh, the last couple of weeks before the water came back to our place. So that, that really helped, but you know, carrying 40 liters of water, you know, three kilometers is pretty heavy. You know, oh, yeah, for sure. sure. Yeah. So I had to do that for a number of weeks. Um, it's, yeah, it was, it was, um, I mean, it, it was, there was, it was both horrible because of, you know, the, the loss of life, um, people I worked with, friends and things like that. But it was, um, there was also some very good moments too, you know, watching people come together. Um, and it, it, it made things very simple too. What was important to us was just family and feeding them. And that was all we had to do, find water, find food. And that was it. That was mm -hmm. all we had to do. Uh, that kind of thing actually made it, um, that was kind of a good thing for us, you know, a little bit of a reset. Say. Yeah. I can see where that yeah. would bring, bring people closer for sure. Yeah. That's, yeah. Uh, that's a good silver lining to that situation. Yeah. So, so you had the earthquake, how long was it until you uh, actually went to Australia after that? All right, let me, yeah. let me say, you had the earthquake, you had, the earthquake happened. I'm, I'm trying to keep this in perspective for, for viewers. So the earthquake happened, then you rebuilt, right? How, yeah. how long of a time frame was that? That was nine months. Okay. And then yeah. you, from then to, uh, heading to Australia, how long was that? That was yeah, nine months. So, okay. We, yeah. I headed back to Australia. I arrived in Australia on the 21st of December. Okay. Um, I hadn't actually, I was doing some part-time work, but my business started, was going to take off again in, in Jan. I was planning to reopen in January of that, of uh, 2013. Okay. Um, but that's when I was diagnosed. Okay. So, um, it took about nine months to sort of, we, we weren't just, uh, rebuilding for ourselves as well. You know, we went out to, um, where the, a lot of places were underwater. Um, some, there were some buildings that left, left standing a lot of the devastation afterward, after the tsunami and the quake itself, where it looked like a war zone. Um, so we were basically cycling through, you know, like all sorts of buildings collapsed and all that sort of stuff. Um, but some buildings that did survive you know, houses and you're out in the um, suburbs that were further out and survived being underwater. We went out and helped clean out, you know, because they had so many, so many layers of mud. Um, mm -hmm. but that was an eye opener as well. Yeah, you know, there were boats lined along the, the roads, um, the streets and, um, even the houses that did survive were in pretty bad condition. Um, and you know, some of the shelters we, we took out, um, we managed to raise some money and I 
I took food, blankets and um, things like that out to different shelters. Some shelters still didn't have any electricity. Mm. And um, I went up into the mountains of a place called Ishinamaki. And some of these shelters were just children. You know, they didn't have their parents. Um, they just had some volunteers there taking care of them. Wow. It was, it, it was really sad, but, um, you know, it was also great to see that, you know, I took out some games and we played some games with them and we did all sorts of things. It was, it was a lot of fun, um, you know, compared, you know, considering it was such a bad situation. Um, mm -hmm. So there was um, a lot of that along the way. We did that for several months. Um, so that it took me uh, that nine months to sort of and to get things back on track for us. Um, and, you know, a lot of people they did put up emergency housing eventually, and the following year, like I think, um, for a couple of years afterwards, a lot of these people went to the emergency housing because. Some of these suburbs uh, just completely disappeared, you know, after the tsunami, entire suburbs just disappeared off, off the, uh, off the coastline. Um, wow. That is incredible. Yeah. Uh, it, I'm surprised it, it, it only took you nine months. Really? I mean, it seems that's, um, that's incredible in and of itself that it only took you nine months to get back to, to, uh, where you were getting ready to get hit the ground running again. Yeah. Well, we were, um, well, yeah, you know, we had friends helping as well. You know, um, it, it was quite, it's kind of, it wasn't too difficult to get, um, everything lined up. Um, the, the hard, I think the hardest part was about to start actually the next year and start actually opening up and start working again. Mm -hmm. Um, but we were pretty motivated to, after the quake, we were very motivated actually to try and get things back on track. Um, you know, we really didn't have any choice, you know? Okay. It was, well, just, it was you know, have to do is have to do. Yeah. You know, yeah, for sure. What we said. So yeah. you've already brought us, uh, on a journey that seems, uh, in extremely incredible, uh, compared to most everybody else. And, uh, and now you've gone through all this so far, the earthquake, the tsunami, uh, going to, uh, Australia and then receiving this prognosis. So let, let's pick up there. And, uh, so where did you go at, from that, that, from that point? All right. So the first, well, they, they started me on chemotherapy after they um, got my kidneys, uh, flowing again. They couldn't get, um, they put stints in both my kidneys, but my left kidney was dead and it just shrunk to the size of a pea. Mm. Um, but my right kidney was starting to open up and was starting to flow again. So they started me on chemotherapy. The first lot of chemotherapy, um, the plan was for six to eight rounds of what they call R chop. Um, it's a particularly, um, brutal kind of, uh, chemotherapy. Uh, you have like four bags of treatment in one session. Um, and then they give you three weeks off to recover. Um, it's. It, the, the chemical, the, the dosage, the dosage was particularly high because, um, my entire body was riddled with cancer being, uh, lymphatic, um, all my lymph nodes were also malignant tumors. So it wasn't just that one big mass around my aorta, was, all my lymph nodes were also malignant tumors around my, my entire body as well. So. Um, it was, you can't operate on this. You couldn't, they couldn't operate on, even on the main tumor. They, the only hope I had was a remission period and to try and shrink it down. Um, I had my first treatment and, um, my wife then had to go back to Japan. Um, 
that was that was pretty tough for us because we didn't know if uh, we'd ever see each other again. And in natural fact, like the, the two weeks that I came to Australia for vacation, that was the longest I'd spent away from my wife, actually. Since the day we met, we'd seen each other almost every day. Um, and you know, having to, the worst part was at the time for me was the fact that we'd just lost everything again after losing so much that the year before, and then, you know, what the, the earthquake couldn't take, the cancer took, you know? Right. Um, and now I didn't even know if I was going to survive long enough to see my wife again. So that was really hard. And then, um, but the first treatment itself, you know, it was, it was broken up over uh, a two week period because it, it takes, um, it takes a little while for your body to adjust to this, this kind of chemical dosage. Um, and I, at the time I was thinking, no, oh, this is a bit of a cakewalk. Like, you know, I, I wasn't feeling all that bad. I was vomiting a little bit, um, but I could handle that. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, uh, the, the second dose was all in one day, but it's over eight hours. And as it progresses, the, the, the dose is given to you over a shorter period each time. Um, but it leaves you the second dose, the second, um, treatment, that's when all the pain and, uh, everything started. While we are actually being treated, the, my body would literally, it would be shaking uncontrollably. Um, I'd be in, in the bed and I just, my, my leg would start shaking. Then my whole body, it would just be almost like coming off the bed, like in convulsion sort of thing. It's very violent, but, uh, shaking. Goodness. Um, and, but. While that, and then while that happens, they, they give you some relaxants and they give you, um, these heated, uh, blankets, um, and it, you sort of calm down a bit. Um, it was, it was a bit scary at first, the first time this happened, but you know, the nurse told me, yeah, this is normal. It just, it's a good thing. And, uh, that just means that it's working. <laughs> yeah. It, it didn't, it didn't really feel that way though, you know? Wow. So that's I did normal then. Yeah. But I did actually, uh, enjoy the, the, the heated blanket that felt really nice. But I think that that's a normal reaction. Um, that, that's just, you see all these other people being treated at the same time was, was a bit scary. Um, and then, uh, the next day, that's when the pain starts, you have to give yourself um, a white cell injection so that you can, it, it, it sort of stimulates your, your marrow so that you can start producing white cells for yourself. Um, but this, this means that uh, this is when the, the bone pain starts. Uh, it, it leaves you, the chemotherapy itself leaves you, uh, what left me with you know, hundreds, literally hundreds of ulcers in my mouth. My entire mouth was swollen. My tongue was swollen and with sores, these ulcers, um, I couldn't open or close my mouth. It, um, and then, uh, the bone, the bone pain was like, you could literally feel every bone in your body, even the joints. Like I could, I could literally feel my toes, my, my fingertips even the suture joints in my skull and even just lying in bed, the weight of my own body felt like it was going to crush my bones into dust. Wow. Mm -hmm. It's it, any kind of movement was extremely painful. Um, but the chemotherapy leaves you with, um, severe IBS. So you have to move. Um, I couldn't eat, I couldn't drink. I, the only relief I had for the sores in my mouth was, uh, like a bicarb and salt mouthwash. Um, it's, 
was it was extremely violent and it leaves you vomiting a lot because of, and because of all this bone pain and everything these sores in your mouth and everything um when you vomiting especially if you're on an empty stomach um it was extremely painful and it felt like i was vomiting up bones you know from my skeleton system it, it was extremely painful um there would Obviously, I, I didn't actually try to fast, but it, I just, I just couldn't eat, you know, for mm-hmm. a, a week at least. And, um, the only relief I had from it was every now and then I would take, uh, a, a protein shake. Um, I'd mix it with, uh, things like butter to add some fat and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, because vomiting on an empty stomach was just so much more painful. I couldn't eat anything solid and even just the protein tree was quite painful. Um, and you know, this treatment went on for, um, for the full eight rounds. We do update scans every, uh, every couple of treatments. Um, and at first, the first three treatments didn't look like it had done anything for me. Um, so on the fourth one, after the treatment, they scanned again and, um, it, it had started, it's kind of, it was a slow start, and, but then it started to, uh, you know, shrink the tumor down a bit and my bloods were starting to get better and my, um, my, um, my spleen was starting to clear up and things like that. Um, I was really hoping at the time that the sixth one would be the last one. But uh, they kept it going to eight. Mm. Um, and usually by the time, um, by about the third week, so usually about five days before the next treatment, I would start feeling good again. I could, I could move around and I could eat and, um, you know, I felt pretty good. Even though I wasn't eating much, um, I was getting fat, a lot of um, things were happening, you know, they had me on a lot of steroids and a lot of, uh, other medications. I had about two bags. Every time I went and got treatment, I would come home with two bags of like two shopping bags full of medications. Wow. Plus, plus a freezer bag for the white cell injection. It was, it was like, I couldn't eat, I couldn't get anything down. So taking medications was really hard and it got to the point where I would look at these, these medications and sometimes I'd, I'd be standing there looking at them for an hour before I could get them down because I just, I couldn't stomach them. I can and, imagine. I mean, it seems um, as many as you're talking about, it seems like that's almost a meal in and of itself. Mm. I mean, that's just yeah incredible. Yeah, it basically was. There was a meal of pills. You know, mm. and I was getting very bloated, very round. I had this, uh, what they call moon face, you know, um, because of the steroid, because mm-hmm. steroids raise your blood sugar. So basically what they're doing is they're destroying my body and they're feeding the cancer, you know, with these blood sugars. Um, this was, I mean, I didn't know this at the time and I thought that you know, I, I wasn't too concerned. All I was really concerned with was trying to fight this cancer and trying to get through this treatment. And I developed what they call white coat syndrome. And it just means that like even the thought of going back to the hospital would make me sick. There's certain smells from the hospital that were similar to the hospital. Mm-hmm. I had, I was so sensitive to everything around me that I couldn't have anyone around me, um, other people, the smell of other people's, uh, body odor would make me vomit. Um, mm. the thought of food would make me vomit. The, just, uh, thinking about going back to the hospital because I knew what it was going to be. like, even in that five days where I felt good, knowing that I had to go back and do this all again, it was really tough, you know, and this is what 
a lot of people can't get through is that period, knowing that you have to go through that treatment again. Um, it gets too much for them. Um, and it was, it, it was very eye opening too, because at the time we didn't have anywhere to live. So, um, when my wife could actually come back to Australia some months later, um, because I then had a carer, um, I was, we were allowed to live in a foundation. Uh, it was called the Leukemia Foundation and they hadn't, they have apartments for people who don't, you know, don't live in the city. So that was the only reason we had a roof over our head. Before that, I was basically just living on, in, um, my family, like family and friends, spare rooms and, and, and lounge chairs until I could, uh, you know, until my wife could come back and join me in Australia. Mm -hmm. Um. So it was, it was a lot of, uh, still a lot of stuff happening on the out, you know, outside of the hospital as well. Um, and then we got to number six and I was hoping it'd be the last one because I was, I was, a, I was an absolute mess by this time. Um, white coat syndrome and, uh, just, I was just so tired of the treatment. Um, I was fat, I was weak. Because I, my muscles and everything were really weak. They shrunk. Um, everything, basically the bones and everything have just been destroyed. But, um, we, we get into number six and they say, okay, we're going to have to do number eight because it just hasn't done, it hasn't cleared everything out yet. It was tough. Um. But I kind of got excited after the seventh one because I'm thinking, okay, there's just one more, you know, just one more. I can do one more. Mm -hmm. And that kept me going. Um, and then that brought me down to stage two. So it hadn't actually cleared it up, but my blood, my blood was nice and clear and my spleen was clear. Everything was good, except the tumor itself had only shrunk about 25%. So. They, they labeled me as stage two and they put me through 18 rounds of radiation, just targeted radiation to, uh, shrink the tumor down uh, a bit more. So we did that every day and that was a cakewalk. That was so easy for me compared to the r -chop, The radiation was very, very easy. I still needed medications. I was still on steroids. I was still on, um, anti-nausea pills and things like that, but. I didn't have any of the, um, the vomiting, the violent sort of bone pain or anything like that. So I was feeling pretty good. Um, then they decided to put me on what they call, uh, rituximab, um, preventive, preventative, um, sort of treatment. Uh, rituximab is, is one of the treatments that's part of our trial, but, um, they wanted to, this was a two year course every two months of treatment. Um, this was the idea was that this would, uh, prolong my remission period. Um, so I was hopeful, you know, um, it was very easy to do. It made, it left me sick like it, for about, you know, three to five days, but it was only every two months. And in between I had plenty of time to recover. And I was feeling pretty good. Um, it about, um, it was about that time the leukemia foundation also found, uh, they also had another house for us to go and stay in while I was being treated. And, mm -hmm. um, so it, it that was really good. We didn't have to look for a home at the time. Um, nice and advice. yeah, so that was one, one less thing to worry about, you know? Mm -hmm. And about that time, my wife got her visa so she could stay in Australia. So that was really helpful as well. So it was really, everything was going really well and we were very positive. And I was thinking, hopefully, you know, if this can give me a longer remission period, then hopefully we can go back to Japan soon and everything will be okay again. I can start living life again. Mm -hmm. um, and about 12 months into the two year course. I, uh, I, I wasn't feeling great, but I was feeling well enough that I thought, okay, I can go back to the gym and my wife was going to a local gym and I was thinking, okay, let's, 
because so she kind of motivated me to go back to the gym and I started back and everything was okay. I had to be very careful, of course, because my immune system was very low. Um, so I didn't want to pick up any infections, uh, mm -hmm. like a cold would just last me months, you know? Um, mm -hmm. so because it just kept coming back, I had nothing to fight it with. So I, I started back to the gym and I was, I was feeling really good. Actually, I think like very positive. Um, in 2013, November, I was still stable at stage two. Uh, January comes around 2014 and two years to the date exactly, they diagnosed me with very high stage four again. Oh my goodness. So basically I just did two years solid chemotherapy and I'm back to square one. Hmm. Um, and that, that was really demoralizing. I, I thought I was fine. I thought I was healthy again. I thought I was doing really well. And all of a sudden I'm very high stage four again. And that's, that's when things got really bad. I, um, I, I, I didn't want to go through the R trop again. So I asked them, you know, without treatment, what, what would my, my time limit be? And again, it was, you know, maybe three months. So I was, I was, I was thinking about it, you know, I was thinking, do I really want to go through this, you know, mm -hmm. and, um, but, you know, they convinced me that this, uh, the, this, they wanted to put me through uh, a clinical trial, um, for what they call bendamustine. And uh, it's not a new drug, but it was, it just hadn't been used in Australia for a while. So they, did, they just wanted to do a clinical trial. And they assured me that it was, it was far more mild than the r -trop, but would be just as effective. So I figured, well, okay. It, if it's not as bad as r -trop, then it should be a cakewalk. And you know, I got through r -trop, I can get through this, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and again, the plan was for six to eight rounds because uh, these heavy dose chemotherapies, you know, you more than any more than eight rounds and you pretty much guaranteed it's actually illegal because they, they, they pretty much guaranteed to kill the patient after that. Um, yeah. So uh, it's particularly brutal and I mean, it, it really is hard on the body. It's not, it's not the, um, like it basically it's like nuclear power okay uh just frying you from the inside like all your organs uh, get so, you know take a, a lot of damage including your brain uh muscle tissue bone tissue everything it's just when it goes through this kind of treatment it is um it does a lot of damage um so it's something you really should have to you really have to think about uh, so is it essentially like uh last resort type of, uh, treatment. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it now I would say differently, but at the time, yeah, an absolute last resort treatment. Mm -hmm. Um, and that, that was the thing I had to think about. And uh, of course they did talk me into it. Um, and yeah, because I, I still had to think about my wife, I didn't want to leave her. Right. Um, and so, yeah, especially like she was stuck in Australia looking after me. And so it was kind of, you know, yeah, I really just had, mostly just, I did it for her. So we went into a thinking, we're, we're pretty positive actually. We were thinking because it was supposed to be very mild compared to our child. Um, the first treatment I. I felt fine while I was actually being treated. I drove home because I didn't have, to, I didn't have anyone to drive me to hospital. So I had to drive myself to the hospital for each treatment. Um, so I got home and then I started, I was getting dizzy. 
I had a strong fever and it just kept on climbing and climbing. Um, and I told my wife, I'm just going to go to bed and sleep it off. But, uh, she decided to call the, the hospital and an ambulance. Um, and they come and got me and took me back to the hospital. So it was a good thing they did because I wouldn't have made it through the night. Um, I would have died that, that night. Um, so they ended up keeping me in hospital for three days after that, after the first treatment. Um, and then the, the same thing happened for the second treatment. Then the, this, but then in the second and third treatment, I had the same problem with fevers, but my arms started to develop really thick, long blood clot. Um, and by the fourth treatment, both my arms were full of really long, thick blood clots all the way down from my shoulders, down to my wrist. And Good. it was, they were so thick, they stood out. Um, like I was still, still very chubby because of the, all the steroids they were treating me with and mm -hmm. other pills and things. So these, my veins were standing out like a 3d roadmap. It's very wow. difficult to do when it's, we need that chubby. Um, and this is because of the newest uh, round of treatments. Yeah. Or from the treatment. Um. So they decided that they, they couldn't treat me through my arms anymore because they, the, because of the blood clots. So they decided to put a port on the right side of my chest under the skin and sort of, it sits underneath the skin and it's kind of like, um, it looks like a, just a big lump in mm -hmm. your chest mm -hmm. and it has a tube that feeds straight into your heart so that when they pump it in, it just goes into your heart and it just disperses really quickly with each beat. But it was uh, a little bit um, daunting. It was basically, it was, it was pretty frightening actually because they just filled up both my arms with these blood, these huge blood clots. So I was concerned about what this was going to do to my heart. Hey, yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. Man. Um, but I really didn't, at the time, just didn't have a choice. So we kept going. And... You know, along, because it's a clinical trial, we had scans on every test and uh, I had a clinical trial nurse that was taking care of me and calling me every day and that sort of thing. So it was a very tight, um, trial. Um, I think it was like the, which was great actually, because one of the, one of the treatments that they tried to give me, they were gonna, gonna start feeding me with this chemotherapy was about six months out of due date and she noticed that the, the, the due date was, you know, it was like six months ago. So I can imagine what that would have done to me. Um, but the scans showed that along the way, it just hadn't done anything for me. This treatment edited by treatment four, they realized that it wasn't doing anything. It had almost killed me three or four times. Um, but they decided to keep going, <laughs> which was wow. it kind of thinking back now, I just, I couldn't, un I can't understand that thinking because obviously it's not working. It's not doing anything for the patient and all it, all it is doing is put me at greater risk of, of dying. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's kind of like, um, they have a plan. It's kind of like paint by numbers. You know, you got a painting, you paint by numbers. So you have to follow each, the plans already set out and they don't deviate, you know? Um, and I don't blame the people. I mean, they're good people. They're just, it's just the way it is. This is the way that the system is, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, but we got to, uh, treatment six, um, it still hadn't done anything but they managed to control my fevers and everything before my treatment, uh, this time, uh, we went out to eight treatments and it, it did nothing. The whole, the whole eight treatments did nothing basically. So it was all risk. It was all risk and, uh, no benefit. Um, so then they decided that 
this had to go on with a clinic with a um, stem cell transplant. Um, because of the the nature of it, because I was still um, well, I still had quite a bit of damage from the the clinical trial. The um, I still had clots in my arms and things like that. Um, but it had done nothing. So this stem cell tra uh, transplant had to be extreme, like to the extreme in uh, dosage. So it was the plan was seven days of twenty four hour at a time chemotherapy. Seven days straight, 24 hours at a time. So there were three different bags fed through over this 24 hour period. Um, now this, they couldn't use, um, the port in my arms. My arms were full of clots still. Um, so they had to put a, a CV line in. Now this was two rubber tubes. It was in the left side of my chest that fed straight into my heart again. And then it had two little connectors that came out and like I said, basically it was just, it hang outside of my chest and, uh, they connect the, the bags of treatment with these little, um, connectors. Um, this, the CV line is supposed to usually supposed to stay in your chest for up to six months because you might need treatment, um, that's, you know, afterwards, but, uh, day three they found that it had an infection in it. Um, so they had to pull it out. They didn't know whether they had to plan whether to keep going with the transplant or not, which they did. Um, but basically the, this infection had uh, now gone through my entire body and they pulled it out. The basically all they did was just brace my shoulder and just pull the tube out you know, and left it at that. But from there, um, I basically flatlined a number of times because of the infection. They had to, they kept the transplant running, but they had to put it, um, through, uh, one of my arms and my port in my chest on the other, on the other side. Cause that was still in there on the right side. Mm -hmm. Um, it just made it more difficult. Um, but because of the infection, everything just went downhill very, very quickly. I, I stopped breathing a number of times. My heart would, uh, my heartbeat would fluctuate up and down. And, uh, this went on for weeks. I, I was, I was, this one really cooked me so badly that I, I had a number of ulcers in my stomach. I had, uh, I was vomiting up skin like layers really thick thick layers of skin uh, from my esophagus and my stomach and everything Good. else I was, yeah i was passing layers of skin and everything um i had severe ibs i was i couldn't think because my brain was mush um it was um a lot of the time I just wasn't there. I, I would wake up, like I'd pass out, I stopped breathing. I'd wake up, I'd be on all these oxygen, mach oxygen machines and, uh, heart rate monitors and doctors and nurses standing around me. And, um, they, they quarantined my room, um, because of the infection. Um, so the only one allowed in were the doctors, there were the staff, obviously the doctors, nurses, and my wife. Um, it, it was a particularly, uh, brutal month. Um, I lost 42 kilos, about just over a hundred pounds in wow. two weeks. Yeah. Um, and I wasn't, I always, um, like I was, be, be, I was quite bloated, like fat from chubby from when I went in because of all the steroids and everything that were treating me with beforehand. Um, so I was about, I went from, um, 200 pounds down to, uh, just over a hundred pounds. Good. Um, I, I was, I was broken, you know, I, I couldn't move. Um, and the prognosis pretty much 
from that point was if I did survive, they didn't expect me to survive the, the transplant. I had to make a will before I went in and they didn't expect me to come out of it. And there was a number of times where I almost didn't. Um, but from there, I was in there for about five weeks. And I mean, that was, that was really hard. Actually, just being in there was really hard for me. I, I couldn't handle it. It was mentally, um, it was, it was tough, but the one good thing is my wife was absolutely amazing through this period. Like she would come and visit me. The, uh, she would stay with me the whole day. And I mean, a lot of the time I wasn't awake because I, like I'd stopped breathing and she was watching all these doctors and nurses trying to bring me back. And it was kind of difficult for her. Um, but she would come in, she'd stay all day. She'd go home, she'd catch a bus home, go shopping, and then she'd cook something or try and make something that hopefully I could try and eat the next day. And then she'd come in the next day and do it all over again. You know, mm. she was amazing. But, you know, I think you know, that was kind of hard for her to see because, you know, for about three years after that, she would wake me up every now and then just, you know, if I was sleeping long, you know, she'd just wake me up to make sure that I was still breathing, you know, um, because, you know, it got to that point where the, the, the nurses would do that every 20 minutes, they wouldn't let me sleep, you know, mm -hmm. um, they would wake me up just to make sure I was still breathing. And, um, but you know, when I did get home, you know, I, I couldn't move. I had lost so much weight. I was half my body weight, basically. Um, and my, all my bones, my connective tissue, my muscles were so brittle and dry that even trying to grip, like just trying to grip a cup, it was painful. It was really, really painful. I couldn't, I really couldn't move. Uh, I was basically, um, you know, people were, were trying to, well, people basically, the prognosis was, this was about as, as good as it gets, you know, like, um, my, the outlook for the future was if I survive or have a remission period was uh, basically I'd be spending the rest of it in a wheelchair. Um, and that might be, you know, positive thing, you know, compared to where, you know, I was at the time. Right. Cause I was basically, uh, between the, between the clinical trial and the stem cell transplant, we had to move from the leukemia foundation house into, uh, our own place and all we could afford or all, all we could, um, find it close to the hospital was a, a tiny little studio apartment. Um, and basically it was, um, two steps, like from the bed to the bathroom and the kitchen was basically two steps. That was it. Wow. And that's all we could afford. And when I did get home, you know, five weeks after the transplant, the, um, that was basically where I stayed for a number of years, about two and a half years before I, it was a good two and a half years before I could walk again. And you know, like even just those two steps to the bathroom or the kitchen, I couldn't do that, um, without help and without a, a, a walker. Um, I couldn't use a wheelchair because we just didn't have a space for it. And I couldn't, uh, we just didn't, couldn't even afford one at the time. So. Um, which I think was probably a good thing because it, it, it meant for me not to rely on that, you know, I had to get up and I had to walk, mm -hmm. but that was so, I mean, it was so painful to do that, um, that it, it took me before I could even move my legs again, enough that I could do that. It took me two and a half years before I could, um, walk 
at a pace, even with a, a, a walking stick a, a, and an aid to keep up with my wife, you know, mm -hmm. um, which was really, yeah, you spend know, that much time in bed is it, mentally draining and it, especially when you're in pain, constant pain for that kind of length of time, it, it really wears you down emotionally. Mm -hmm. Um, but I found that after the transplant, I was, um, I was craving meat, especially fatty meat. You know? Um, it was something I just, um, I, I'd never actually craved meat before in my life, my entire life. And, uh, it just felt like when I, when I had it, like I cook a big steak and I'd eat it, it just felt like my body was, um, soaking it up like a sponge, you know, mm -hmm. like I knew I needed protein because I needed to rebuild my muscles. I need to get my body moving again. Um. And that was, I was determined to get my body moving again. Um, so I knew I needed to eat meat, but I wasn't really thinking about the, the fat side of things at, at the time, because, you know, my education was all about, you know, lean meats, eat right. lean meats and, uh, eat your carbohydrates, eat your vegetables and, and things like that. Um, but you know, like after the transplant, I was so fried, I couldn't think properly, like. I would have people actually come and visit and they would talk to me for hours and I can't even remember mm -hmm. even seeing them, you know, um, I, I couldn't concentrate for, you know, more than a minute at a time. I couldn't focus on anything. Uh, I was basically brain damaged. Um, and at the time I didn't think much of it. I just, I was just enjoying eating meat. Um, but looking back now, obviously I can see why I was craving this meat so much. Mm -hmm. Um, but it took some time. Um, after that, it was about, it was about five years before I went back to the gym. You know, it was two and a half years before I could walk. And after that, like, I, I just didn't care. I, after the transplant. I had massive problems with IBS, reflux, and, and all these other side effects from the chemotherapy. It was, um, I just couldn't get anything for it. They couldn't give me enough medication. I was on maximum dose for, um, my reflux that they could, uh, that they were allowed to give me. Um, and it wasn't effective. Um, they couldn't give me anything for the IBS. They just kept telling me. Well, they actually gave me laxatives and, um, told me to eat a high fiber diet. Yeah. These are the, the, yeah, the experts, mind you. Um, you know, which, you know, I, I didn't have any trouble going to the toilet. That, that was the problem. You know, like I was going upwards of eight to 10 times a day. So the last thing I needed was, you know, laxatives or, or fiber. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, so, um. And this went on for a, a long time, a number of years. Um, but eventually I found that, um, so, you know, fermented vegetables gave me some relief, uh, things like sauerkraut that really helped with the IBS and also helped with the reflux. Um, and I started using apple cider vinegar as well. Mm -hmm. Basically I was, um. The first two and a half years, I was just basically focused on trying to move. Um, and that was all I really did. And I started with deep breathing exercises because I, I couldn't breathe properly because even the muscles in my abdomen, my rib around my ribs and chest and everything, they were so fried and dry that they, they couldn't, um, expand or contract. So yeah, deep breathing exercises were the first start and. Yeah, even that was, it was very short rounds. So like I'd breathe like 15 breaths and then hold my breath and that sort of thing. So it took time to develop. Um, so th at this point you hadn't heard of the carnivore diet, right? No, 
Nice. But you were you were intuitively your body was wanting fatty meat. Yeah. It was just I was just listening to my body more. Um I was still eating a lot of other um crap food. Right. Um but none not so much I wasn't eating like processed food or deep fried food or anything like that that had, you know, these seed oils and things like that in. Mm-hmm. Um, I've, I've always avoided things like soy. Um, so that's another good thing, but you know, like even from the first diagnosis, you know, every meal has been cooked and prepped at home. We, we don't eat out or very rarely eat out. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, we did, we did enjoy things like, you know, cakes and cookies and things like that, you know, um. And we would buy cookies and things like that as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and pizza and pasta and rice and, you know, my wife's Japanese, so we did eat a little bit of rice. Understand. Basically, yeah. I mean, our, basically our meals were always centered around the meat first though. Yeah. Meat first and then yeah, everything else around it. Um, and that, that really helped a lot actually. I, I, I did. Um, I was feeling a lot better through that period. I was, uh, I was coming back very quickly. Um, even my oncologist couldn't believe how fast I was coming back. And, um, yeah, I did have a lot of setbacks. I had a lot of setbacks along the way, uh, like other treatments, you know, they, they, after a transplant, they give you these injections to, you know, your child, you know, like your childhood uh, vaccines and things mm -hmm. uh, which just crashed my immune system again so that was a pretty major setback for me um but and of course you know trying to walk again yeah you know, I'd, I'd have setbacks I'd, I'd fall down or I'd, I'd injure myself and but you know you just have to get back up and keep going mm -hmm. and uh, but it got to the point where about five years in afterwards, my wife was at the gym and I was, I was quite fat, you know, I, I had a 48 inch waist and, you know, I'm not very tall. So that, that was quite big for me. And, um, it, it was, there's, there's always a breaking moment, you know, there's, um, for me, it was either we were still planning because at the time when you have follicular lymphoma, it's always, you know, every blood test, they could tell you that it's bad, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so every time you get it, go and get a blood test done, they could tell you, okay, look, you, you, you stage four again, it, it's come back. You need more treatment. So this is, you know, it really plays on your mind. So every time you, you know, for about a week or you know, days before each blood test, it was, it, it was quite stressful. And so we just were living, we, uh, we were living from blood test to blood test because we couldn't plan anything further than that. Um, and at the time, like at first that started, that was every week. So we just had no plan at all, mm -hmm. you know? Um, but eventually it, after a few years, it, it came out to, uh, every six months and that's where it, we're still at now, um, every six months with my oncologist, I have a blood test. Um, so for, you know, it's been nine and a half years now, For the, about eight of those years, it was always, we were only planned at six months at a time. Um, because and even, even the lease, like on our rental house, our apartment, was only six months at a time because there's no point signing a 12 month lease if I'm not going to be around that, you know? Mm. Um, but you know, the five year period, I just, I was sick of waiting for debt, you know? Um, I was throughout that whole period, it was very emotionally up and down because I, I didn't know whether or how long this was going to last. Um, and. I just got sick and tired of it. I said, look, I just, I, even when I was trying to learn how to walk again, I'm saying, look, you just have to either get on with dying or get on with living. You know, that was, 
basically it. That was my mindset was either, either just don't wake up, which I was very happy not to, or, or get up and do something. I just had to do something and I couldn't, because I couldn't plan a long, like a, 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 a long term sort of plan. I was basically just looking at, oh, what can you do? You know, what can you do right now? Yeah. And then I, I do that and I think, okay, well, all right, let's, let's see what, what can you do next? Yeah. And that's pretty much how it progressed. Uh, it was, I kind of look at it like you're, you're driving at night and you, when the headlights are on, you can only see so far. So you drive to that point and then you can see the next point, you know, yeah. and that's basically what it was for me, um, because I can't plan long term. So I just, I'll get to this point and go, what can I do next? And what can I do next? And I just progress from there. And you know, from the five end of five year, uh, um, Mark, you know, I was fat, I was overweight. I was depressed, had anxiety. I didn't want to go outside. I didn't want to do much. And basically my wife just said, well, why not start the gym again? And that was brilliant. You know, it was, um, I still had to be very careful because my immune system was so low. Um, I was having trouble with that and I was, I was basically on a keto style diet already. Um, but going back to the gym sort of motivates you to, or, and get moving again, sort of motivates you to cut all the, the sweets out as well, you know? Mm. Um, so that was a good thing. And then, um, it just, it, like I said, it just sort of progressed from there and yeah, I did lose a bit of weight and I was, I, I got more and more, I got. As it progressed, I got more and more strict with my diet. And then my wife found um, this young guy in Japan who said he only eats meat. And I thought, yeah, I'm thinking, yeah, that's, that's BS, you know? Right. I, I literally said that. I said, bullshit. <laughs> um, because. And so, look, you know, athletes have been doing that for a long time. They've been cutting carbs to get lean for a uh, competition. You know? mm -hmm. It's nothing new. It's not, it's just a gimmick. Okay. It's nothing new. Everyone does that, but right. you can't, you can't live like that. It's, it's not sustainable, you know, um, because I was still kind of thinking about what I learned, what I'd learned in school, you know? It, eat your lean meats, eat, get your macros, get your, your, your carbs and things like that. Um, but I, I decided to have a look at it. I checked it out and I found Doc Baker and, uh, his book, the, the carnival diet. And mm -hmm. I'm thinking, um, well, okay. Well, he's not really trying to sell anything. I mean, except for the book and then I'm thinking. All right, I'll check it out. And then I started finding all these other people talking about it. And I, I saw what they were doing with uh, diabetes. And I figured, well, if they can do that with diabetes, can they do it with blood cancer? And I found uh, Professor Seafried. Mm -hmm. And I found, I don't know if you ever saw that dog uh, that had a really large tumor on its nose. And when they put it on an all meat diet, um, without any kind of treatment, it shrunk this tumor down to nothing and it's yeah. still living now. So I've seen that and it's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. That's, that's what really convinced me. Um, I figured I, I didn't have anything to lose, um, by trying it. So I, I figured uh, at the time I was still taking, even though I had a very clean diet, I was still taking supplements. Mm -hmm. I had, uh, every now and then I, like, I had protein powders and, um, like amino acids and, uh, creatine and other things and, uh, vitamins and minerals and that stuff. Um, so I figured, well, I'm either going to prove it or disprove it. So I decided to stop everything and, and just went straight to, uh, fatty meat. Uh, I kept, and the more I researched the fat, 
more realize uh, how important it is for my lymphatic system. Um, it was, it wasn't really a, a difficult transition because I was already on a very clean diet. Um, I really just cut out the carbs and get it. I mean, I think I wasn't going to lose anything. So it, I just said, uh, well, my wife was in Japan at the time and I figured I gave her a call and I said, look, I'm going to try it. I'm going to try this, um, carnivore diet. I'm just going to eat fatty meat. That's all I'm going to eat. And the, the hardest part was getting my head around the eating more fat. Yeah. You know, because I was always convinced that you had to eat lean meats. You know? Right. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm sorry. Hang on, hang on just a second. So yeah, I was hit. It's, it's almost comical for, to hear you say that that's the hardest part after everything that you have been through, <laughs> the mm. hardest part <laughs> was to yeah. accept the fact that eating fat is good for you. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, at the time, because you know, <laughs> it, it's kind of an awakening, you know, like you realize that your education is complete BS. Right. Mm. Um, so, um. Yeah, I just said it. And even when I first started, I was still, I still ate a uh, chicken breast, but I started putting the skin on and, and I added some fat to it, like, and lots of butter and things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, but the more I research into the, you know, what fats can do for your lymphatic system, the, the, the more you realize that, you know, they're absolutely essential. Um, so it, that developed and. About three months into the carnivore diet, I, I had to see my oncologist again and you know, this was a, a real eye, eye opener because this blood test, all my blood markers right across the board. And there are a number of them. There's about like, you know, so many different markers that we look for that they actually count for my disease, mm -hmm. but all of them jumped, uh, in a positive way eight to 10 points right across the board with, and I had done nothing except I changed nothing except, um, just go straight to meat and fatty meat. Um, I was before kind of all, I had already like over the nine years of remission, I had already gotten down to, uh, just one medication. So I'd already gone down from like two shopping bags full of medications down to just one for reflux. And that was, uh, you know, just, um, every couple of days I was taking it. So I was, I was doing pretty well actually. Mm -hmm. Um, but my markers were not, they were, they weren't very stable and they weren't very high. They were at least 20 points below a standard, like a, an average healthy range. Mm -hmm. Um, so that first blood test out on carnival was a real eye opener. It, it was exciting, you know, and you know, as before it was always quite stressful getting blood tests done because even though I felt fine, I didn't know when or, or if the, you know, the blood cancer was going to be back. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was really cool. Um, and it was that time I figured, well, all right. Um, look at, for the last four years, I haven't had a GP, so I haven't had, um, a, a, a very close monitoring of my blood, um, because of, you know, all the BS that's been going on around the world. Right. Um, and I, do, I just have a very deep distrust and it. it here in Australia, it's very difficult to find a decent one, but, um, several months ago, uh, I did find a good one, uh, a guy who came out from Japan and, um, he, it's really good. So I decided, okay, we'll go see him. And, um, now I'm getting my bloods done every three months because I'm actually that excited to see it. Mm -hmm. Whereas before I, I just put it off. I didn't like having to get my bloods done. Um, it was very stressful. But, um, now I'm quite excited about it. And the second, just the second blood test into carnival 
my blood markers moves, all of them right across the board are all inside a normal, healthy range. <laughs> they were very, I love yeah, that. that's incredible. Um, that was, they were quite low in, in that range, but they're still inside a normal, healthy range, which is just remarkable. And it's, how, how did not, you feel once you've seen that? Absolutely excited. Like, um, it was something I, I didn't think would happen again. You know, I, I it has been basically it had been 13 years since I had a decent, um, blood test, like a, a healthy blood markers. So, um, that was just incredible. Um, and that's not even, that's not. I mean, that's the, the major thing that I look for, the major thing that has been helping me, or the, or the thing that uh, is most important, I should say, mm -hmm. um, obviously get my, my bloods out. Um, and you know, I've since had blood tests done again and they're stable. They are stable in a normal, healthy range. Next month I get to go see my oncologist again. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, but. Apart from that, the, it's not just keeping me in remission and keeping me stable. Um, the, the other benefits, the recovering from not just the cancer, but recovering from the damage done by chemotherapy has been remarkable. Like I know a lot of people will say, you know, when they start when I mean, they go from the standard Western diet and they go into carnivore, they have this brain fog. For me, it's much more dramatic because I can think again, I can concentrate, I can focus, I can remember. It is, uh, basically it is, uh, I wouldn't say it's a hundred percent, but it is reversing the brain damage that I suffer from or the chemotherapy. Um, my overall well-being, my health, my, um, even my, I like, I was fairly positive, you know, the last nine years or so, but my positive attitude is everything is just uplifted being on carnival, just eating lots of fat, you know? Um, I love that. yeah, it's just, I feel, I feel young again, you know, like I'm, I'm 50 years old. And I'm starting life again. Um, and yeah, and I'm still in the gym. I still go to the gym most days and I'm, I'm working hard on that. And, uh, my recovery from gym is much quicker. Um, like I don't get as much muscle soreness, uh, things like that. Mm -hmm. I, I just feel, um, I feel probably better than what I did when I was in my twenties, you know, and even after everything that I've been through, um, the recovery has been incredible. Uh, and it's only been a short time really. So I'm really looking forward to the future, which is a big thing considering, you know, beforehand I couldn't plan more than six months at a time. So, you know, looking forward to the future has been a, a very big change. Um, that's incredible. It, that is yeah. incredible, Dave. Right. I mean, it, to me, uh, hearing this firsthand, you know, uh, it, it seems like, you know, when you're going through these trials with the cancer, uh, you know, is you're on, you're on death's door. It seems, uh, you know, you could yeah. pass on at any moment. And then even after the cancer has sort of gone away for the years following that, it's almost like you were the walking dead, right? Yeah. And, and yeah, now you're saying that with this eating fatty meat has somehow brought you back from the dead and you feel better now than you did, you did in your twenties. That's, that's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it, it really is. And I mean, like, I mean, in my twenties, I was doing all kinds of things, you know, I was going to the gym and I was, I was doing triathlons and marathons and all sorts of stuff. So I felt pretty good, you know? Well, I can ever remember feeling this good, you know, um, and it's kind of funny. Yeah. It reminds me, of, uh, coming back from the day, it reminds me of a story. Um, I literally looked like a zombie when I came out of the hospital, 
I was in such a bad way. Like, um, I couldn't walk. I was so hunched over. I looked like, um, I was almost walking in a fetal position sort of thing. Um, mm. but some neighbors, well, in this little apartment building, some neighbors across the hall, um, there was, there, there was this, in the foyer, there was this really bad smell for a couple of weeks. I mean, it was really horrible smell. It got so bad that, um, one of the, one of the other neighbors called the police and because they thought that somebody had died. Wow. Um, and basically we got a knock on the door because the police thought that, well, the neighbors thought that I had died in my room and my wife didn't know what to do with the body. Oh my goodness. Yeah. That's how bad it was. Um, but as it turned out, another neighbor had gone away for a couple of weeks and their fridge had, um, stopped working and all their food went off. Yeah. <laughs> that was kind of funny. Good yeah. thing. That's all it was. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> that's, I that was kind of funny at the time. That's incredible. I mean, yeah. after hearing all of this, it, to me, it seems like you and your wife need to, uh, sit down and, and write a book. I mean, this is an incredible account. Uh, yeah. you know, you're, you're like the definition of Superman. <laughs> well, yeah, well, he wouldn't have the problem, but yeah, it, it was, it's been a very long road and uh, very, yeah, it's been a lot of struggles, ups and downs, a lot of setbacks. Um, I do actually have a book I am just editing at the moment. Um, oh, nice. so I should hopefully, I'm hoping I'll, if I pull my finger out and get it done, I will release that early next year. Awesome. Yeah. I'll, it's be, been one, kind of I'll difficult. be one of the first to buy it. <laughs> well, thank you. It's going to, it's been kind of difficult to write up until recently because I just haven't been able to focus and concentrate very well. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, now it's, it's much easier to write for me at the moment. So I'm really looking forward to that. that that's but awesome. It's, it's one of the things that I, is I mean, apart from the cancer, the blood and everything, it's just been so great that one of the, the, the greatest things for me is being able to think again, being able to, um, you know, my just overall general health has improved that much that, yeah, it's even it, like these, these small wins that you get, you know, um, like I don't get headaches anymore. Um, I don't have any joint pain or anything like that. And, you know, these are the average things that most people get, but, um, after, you know, your brain being fried, basically to be able to come back and think and concentrate again, it, it's really a, a great feeling. So absolutely, and especially the, after the nuclear damage that had been done to you. I mean, that's just incredible. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Um, but I, I think, you know, I'm one of the lucky ones because, you know, I've seen people go through, you know, some of these streets, a lot of people don't survive even things like our chop, um, the treatments themselves, a lot of people die from, um, they destroy your immune system. They're feeding the, the, the disease itself with things like steroids, the mm -hmm. treatments, the, the, the medications, I should say. And. Um, yeah, a lot of people that, that go through this, um, you know, children or older people, and they're just not strong enough to get through it, you know? Right. Um, and while your body is being destroyed by the treatment itself, you know, infection is like even a cold will kill someone. And that's what happens to, a, to most people, you know, they don't actually die from the disease. They die from an infection that, um, has come in because of because the, the treatment is so brutal. Um, now I know, yeah, not all chemotherapies are the same. They are, they're, they're very, some are very mild and even Professor Seafree will recommend a mild form of chemotherapy with a ketogenic low carb diet. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, some of them are, are very, so mild that you don't even lose your hair and you can get it done every week. 
Um, but when it comes to these heavy dose, uh, chemotherapies, um, the, like Professor Seyfried said, like, even if you use the same chemicals in a much lower dosage, uh, with the right diet would be just as effective. Um, and probably more, so, I think more so myself, I think they'd be more than effective. So these are the things that, um, people need to understand. And also most of your nutrients come from the fat. Um, it's like, I, even on, even on a clean ketogenic style diet, I was still having trouble with infections mm -hmm. because, um, I wasn't eating enough fat, enough animal fat. Um, now like 70% of my nutrients come from animal fat. You get all your vitamins and minerals, you get, um, your collagen and everything like that all comes from the fat. So, um, it's, it's absolutely essential, uh, things like, you know, essential vitamins like, uh, vitamin D3, for example, you get from fat and it's the best way to absorb it. Because a lot of, um, vitamins, you know, like supplements, they just break down in the stomach and you don't actually absorb any of them. So you're basically just wasting your money. Mm -hmm. Um, and I have found that on carnival, like the first three months I, I started, I was kind of lean and I started getting a cold. So I increased the fats to get like a, a vitamin boost. Um, and I had a cold, it lasted me two days. That was it. It was gone. Whereas before a cold would last me a month and like, it would just keep coming back because my immune system was so low. I had nothing to fight it with. So, you know, to go from months at a time sick with a cold or worse with, you know, sometimes it might even end up in hospital with a flu mm -hmm. down to just two days, you know, um, it's, it's absolutely, it's miraculous. It, it is just, that would be my next biggest, um, benefit. I would say treating my colds and flus with uh, animal fats. That's awesome. And salt, you know, salt is also, salt is also key. Salt is very really great for getting rid of that esophageal mucus. Um, so things like if you go to the beach and breathe in the salt air and things like that really helps clean out the sinuses. Mm -hmm. Um, but apart from that, you need your vitamins and minerals from animal fats to boost your immune system, because that's where, I mean, your lymphatic system picks everything up from, uh, your digestive tract and absorbs it into the lymph fluid. Okay. And your lymph fluid carries all your, 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 all your nutrients, your vitamins, minerals, proteins, um, including collagen for your bones. Um, it carries your, your white cells, uh, which later develop into T cells. Okay. And, um, then of course you, to get that around your body, the lymph fluid, the lymphatic system relies on your, um, your muscle, your muscles to contract and expand to get that lymph fluid around your body. Mm -hmm. So, which means that you have to move. So if you want to move fats around your body or move any of this around your body, you need to move. Um, so this is why movement is so important to me. Um, but absolutely, you know, this is, this has been the key to, uh, restoring my lymphatic system, restoring my health in general, my bones, my everything. Um, and it's also, you know, the lymphatic system is also the, um, the sewer system. Okay. It, it also takes away the waste from your mitochondria at a cellular, at a cellular level, it takes away all the waste. So, um, you know, when you start on the carnivore diet and you, uh, start oxalate dumping, you know, because after developing oxalates from all the veggies and carbs and things like that, that all that waste gets taken away by the lymphatic system, you know, so, mm -hmm. um, it's very important. I think it's key to pretty much all, pretty much all health issues, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. So before we wrap up here, I, I want to get your take, uh, on, you know, what, what message would you, uh, like to share 
or what advice might you have for others who are battling reoccurring cancer or just cancer in general? Okay. Um, okay. Well, first off, just because they, you get a bad diagnosis, it doesn't mean that it's over. So it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean you have to give up and quit. I've been told many, many times that it can't be done, that it can't be beaten, that, um, you just have to put up with, this is, this is the way it is. If people tell you it can't be done because they haven't seen it done, that's basically it. So show them that it can be done, you know? Um, so don't give up, don't get depressed. Don't, you know, it, it just, it just hard times happen in many different ways and they don't last forever. It just means that, um, it's just a challenge. Nothing is impossible. Okay. It's just a challenge. And that's all it is. Um, next animal fats. Um, it doesn't matter what kind of cancer you have. It, it, it's all a metabolic disease. Okay. Everything else is just down the line and what you need to restore, um, are your mitochondria. Okay. You can develop more, um, stem cells, for example, through exercise and movement. Um, and like I said about the lymphatic system, it, it's about, you know, to get all those vitamins and minerals around your body and your white cells and everything around your body, um, for recovery, to rebuild for health, you need movement. Um, but it all starts with the fuel. It all starts with your food and the best source of nutrients. Um, see, the thing is your body does not crave calories. It doesn't crave energy. It craves nutrients, okay? And it relies on the lymphatic system to get those nutrients to where they need to be, all right? So that you can recover. And the only source of fuel, uh, the only source of energy that does not ferment cancer of any kind, okay, um, is fats, all right? Anything else, uh, including fiber, okay? Fiber are just... They are sugars that they are non, -di non digestible sugars. Okay. So basically you're just eating more sugars. If you have a high fiber diet, um, the, the lymphatic system is so important for absorbing because it absorbs, um, all those nutrients from fats. All right. And of course your, your protein from meat and things like that. Um, which is the, also the problem because, you know, things like seed oils, uh, soy and this, uh, fake vegetable oils that are actually machine oils, lubricants. Okay. It can't tell the difference between these, these fats So it absorbs those fats and it poisons your entire system. All right. That's what these, these, uh, oils are doing. They're poisoning your entire system. Um, so then the, the most important thing is to eat clean. Okay. And like a strict carnival, if you are sick, especially you need to be as strict as possible. That means water, salt, and fatty meat. Um, I eat a lot of salt. I drink a lot of water and, um, I eat a lot of fat. 70% of my nutrients at least come from fat, that beef fat. Okay. Um, but you know, it's up to you. I also eat bacon. You know, bacon fat is, is great too. Uh, it has a lot of potassium. Okay. Mm. Um, so, you know, all your normal vitamins and minerals like zinc, vitamin D and, um, you know, so many other like magnesium and so many other things come from, um, animal fats, okay. Potassium and others. So that is the, the key. So think fats first and then protein. Okay. So fats and, and protein either pork or beef doesn't really matter. It's up to you. Um, and yeah, it doesn't have to be an expensive cut either. Like I, I eat the cheapest beef I can find. Um, and yeah, my butcher gives me uh, beef fat. Like I'll get a couple of kilos of beef fat for free. Yeah. The, a lot of them will do that. They'll give it to you for nothing. So you can do it very, very cheaply and water. Yeah. It's very cheap as well. You know, um, mm -hmm. and a mineral salt. 
like not a table salt, like a nice good uh, colored you know, pink or you know like like red wind salt, something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, remember, focus on the lymphatic system because that's where your immune system is is taken care of as well. You have to give it the right fats, um, lymphatic system and movement. And that will, that will repair everything. So it's really important. Um, things like uh, amino acids, okay. Also from beef, okay. This helps get rid of things like adipose tissue, uh, the fat cell, the fat in your muscle tissue and things like that as well. So it's very, very important. Okay. Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's awesome. Uh, I really love the tips that you have for everybody. Um, that, that's definitely something that, you know, hits, uh, close to home for me, especially for, uh, loved ones and, uh, friends of mine that are, are going through, uh, something similar, um, right now with, uh, with cancer. So I definitely appreciate your thoughts on that and your expertise and your insight. And, uh, I'm sorry that you had to go through all that, but you know, it didn't make you who you are today, which is Superman. And, uh, I definitely appreciate you, Dave. And, uh, so where, where can, uh, everybody find you on the internet? Um, yeah, I, will, I am on, uh, YouTube, obviously, um, DC learning to live. Um, I'm also on rumble, right? on and, uh, Odyssey, but you can also get me on Facebook, um, Twitter and Instagram. Okay. Um, and hopefully I'll have that book done, uh, early next year and, uh, I'll be able to, I'll let you know when that comes out. Awesome. I appreciate that. And we'll, I'll definitely update the description of this video for those that are watching now to, to make sure that that link is in the description. So, uh, if somebody wants to purchase, uh, David's book, um, I definitely would encourage them to do that. So I am, I'm going to put in a request. I'll pay extra for a signed copy. <laughs> no problem. No problem. <laughs> awesome. Well, I appreciate your time today, David. Um, I appreciate you sharing this story with, uh, with me and with, uh, my subscribers. And, uh, I, I really thank you for, uh, for everything that you've done. And, uh, you know, I hope you have a good day. Thanks, mate. I really appreciate you having me on, mate. Um, but any time, I'm sorry, it took a bit long. It's kind of a long story, isn't it? Yeah, it, it needs yeah. to be heard. It needs to be told. So, yeah, yeah. It, yeah. It's, uh, it's all good, man. All right. Very good, then. All right. Thanks, everyone. I hope you enjoyed it.